It's not just germs. Let's take a look at prokaryotic diversity. At the end of this lecture, be able to define transduction, transformation, conjugation, F-factor, R-plasmid, halophile, thermophile, archaea, and niche. Be able to list the different groups of prokaryotes, giving one attribute of each that distinguishes them from the others. Be able to draw a rough phylogeny of prokaryote evolution. Be able to give some examples of prokaryotes from each of the groups, and be able to identify a prokaryotic group by its adaptations. One question we often run into is why bacteria evolve so quickly. Penicillin was introduced in 1943, and it took only 22 years before they were resistant. Ceftrolene was introduced in 2010. It only took three years for resistance to evolve to that. So we have to kind of ask, are bacteria subject to some sort of different set of rules when it comes to evolution? Well, not really. Here are the rules. There needs to be variability in a population. They have to have individuals with different phenotypes. These phenotypes have to be heritable and genetically passed on to offspring. And there has to be some level of differential survival and reproduction. In every generation, there's going to be certain phenotypes that are more adapted than others. And those are going to be the phenotypes that will reproduce the most, causing evolution. So bacteria do still do evolution, and mostly the same as us, but we can see some differences. First off, they have very short generation times. If an E. coli cell, like the millions in your gut right now, has a 1 in 10 million chance of getting a mutation in a certain gene, and there are 2 billion in your intestine per day, that means 2,000 will have a mutation in that specific gene every day. Some of those mutations may actually end up being advantageous. So how many days do E. coli have to evolve? Well, if there are 2,000 new mutants per day in that gene for 75 years, means the chance that something is going to happen well, and there's going to be a good mutation passed on, It'll probably happen. Now, this is quite in contrast to how you have only one generation in that time. The genetic variability of bacteria is also inherited a little differently than us because we look at three things in bacteria, transformation, transduction, and conjugation. Transformation is a bacteria's ability to take up DNA from the surroundings, meaning if nearby bacterial cells die, and leave their DNA just sprawled out there, bacteria in the environment could take up that DNA, which may actually include adaptive genes for them. We actually use transformation to put genes from cattle into E. coli to make them produce proteins, such as recombinant bovine somatotropin, which makes cows mature faster. Transduction is when a virus is going to infect a cell the virus makes new copies of itself, as viri do, and some of those copies are going to include bacterial DNA instead of viral DNA. When the virus injects its DNA into another host, that's going to inject the bacterial DNA instead of injecting the viral DNA. So instead of it getting infected with a virus, it's going to get infected with new DNA, which could actually be beneficial. Conjugation is when bacteria willfully swap DNA. And there's something called the F factor that allows a cell to do donate a plasmid to another cell. This F factor can go from cell to cell, allowing that new cell to also donate plasmids. One plasmid that can get donated is the R plasmid. These are any plasmids that are going to have resistance to, say, penicillin. And resistance genes can destroy penicillin, such as by digesting it. It can be a penicillin pump that pumps the penicillin back out of the cell. It can just prevent the penicillin from entering, or it could alter the shape of the peptidoglycan a little bit so penicillin doesn't affect it. This is the R plasmid and confers resistance. So here we can compare the three possibilities. Transformation is uptake of DNA. Conjugation is between bacteria when they share a plasmid. And transduction requires a virus to move DNA from one bacterium to another. So why do they evolve so fast? Well, those three reasons, fast generation time. This increases variability, and this variability is heritable, and the generations are much faster. Bacteria have been around for a very long time, and they have been evolving very quickly for that very long time, so we shouldn't be surprised that there is a vast diversity of prokaryotes. Numerically and historically, most life on Earth is prokaryotic, and most things that can be done by life are being done by prokaryotes. 
except for being multicellular. We're cool for that. There are three domains of life. There are the eukaryotes, which we will look at later in the course. There are the archaea, which shares some traits with eukaryotes and bacteria, but are technically still prokaryotes because they lack a membrane-bound nucleus. And there are bacteria, prokaryotes that do not share some traits with eukaryotes. So, is the term eukaryotes monophyletic? Yes. Is the term prokaryotes monophyletic? No, it's paraphyletic. Here's a table showing the traits of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. You'll want to know most of this. You can note that peptidoglycan is a bacteria-specific thing. Membrane-bound organelles is a eukaryotic-specific thing. And lipids include some branched hydrocarbons. That's an archaea-specific thing. Let's look at this archaea domain just a little bit more. You end up with things called extremophiles here. And these can be halophiles, which enjoy a salty environment thermophiles, which enjoy a very hot environment, or even methanogens, things that enjoy a methane-rich environment. These are the conditions that archaea can live in, but they don't actually live in a lot of other places. You'll see that these conditions are actually more similar to early Earth than they are to most of Earth today, suggesting that archaea are a very, well, let's say it, archaic line going back a long time and probably predating eukaryotes. Let's look at some prokaryote groups. And the first prokaryote group we're going to look at, this is a bacteria, remember. This is going to be proteobacteria. These are gram-negative. This includes photoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs, and heterotrophs. Some of these proteobacteria, like Helicobacter pylori, are going to be disease-causing. So there are multiple different groups in here, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. You don't need to memorize those. Just know the proteobacteria overall. Chlamydias. These can only survive inside other cells, which definitely suggests that they have evolved more recently because they couldn't be the first thing to evolve. They are very small and they rely on their host for a source of ATP. So these are parasitic. They are gram negative. They have no peptidoglycan. It's not an extra membrane. It's just that they don't have peptidoglycan. Spirochetes have flagellum-like filaments. They're also gram-negative. They're kind of spiral, really. And many of them are free-living. Some of them are parasites. One example of this is syphilis. Cyanobacteria are actually doing a lot of our photosynthesis on Earth for us. This is why you see those green oceans. Cyanobacteria are very common. They are photosynthetic. They're gram-negative. They can be solitary or they can form filaments. Some of them, like anabena, are actually capable of fixing nitrogen. So they can not only photosynthesize, but they can technically nitrogen fertilize themselves, which is one reason they have been so successful. Gram-positive bacteria are gram-positive. That, that's why they're gram-positive. Anyway, you have streptomyces, which is a source of multiple antibiotics, and you can have uh, mycoplasmas too. They're very small. Uh, Gram-positive bacteria can live in many environments. Some can be colonial, but most are solitary. The mycoplasmas have no cell walls, and they have very small genomes. So this has been a tour of some of the diversity of bacteria.